What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. What up, Chris? Ethan, how's it going, man? Chris, I think I'm a bit disappointed. We look at the Cavs versus Bucks game on Wednesday, and it gave a big indication of how difficult it could be for the Cavs to protect the paint with Tristan Thompson out and how much that aspect could impact the other parts of the game. We saw the Bucks make 11 three-pointers in the game and score 54 of their 126 points on the interior. Giannis got his revenge game, scoring 35 points in 35 minutes, and Damian Lillard had 28 points. I knew it was going to be a rough night when Damian Jones entered the game with four minutes and 22 seconds remaining in the first quarter. Did the Tristan Thompson suspension happen at a bad time with the Cavs playing the Bucks and Clippers over a three-game span? I would say yes, because watching Dean Wade and Max Struess wrestle with Giannis or Brooke Lopez while Jared Allen tried to stifle the other matchup on any given possession was disheartening because Giannis is obviously an MVP candidate, and even though Brooke Lopez only had eight points, he had nine rebounds with five of which coming on the offensive glass and creating more opportunities for his squad. Chris, what do you think about how things played out against the Bucks and the Cavs' first look at a second unit without Tristan Thompson? The Bucks are great. I think we have to start there, despite the fact that they've had some ups and downs throughout the course of the season. This is a very talented team, and when they're into the game, where they're engaged, when they're happy, and they looked rejuvenated tonight by the fact that they have a new coach coming and they don't have to deal with Adrian Griffin anymore. This is a juggernaut, and this is going to be a very, very difficult team for the Cavs or any other opponent in the NBA to deal with in a seven-game series when it comes to April and May. So I think we have to start there. Giannis is a problem. It didn't matter who the Cavs put on Giannis. Jared Allen had his attempts. Dean Wade had his attempts. It was Giannis was in one of those kinds of moods tonight. He was scoring at will. He was creating for his teammates. He was pulling down rebounds, pushing in transition, getting whatever it was that he wanted on the offensive end of the floor. Chris Middleton had a throwback type game for him. Dame was very, very good, drew a bunch of fouls, got Isaac Okoro in foul trouble early. I think that contributed to the Cavs' slow start. I think that contributed to the Cavs' poor effort on the defensive end of the floor in the first half. So I think there were just a variety of factors that played into the Bucks winning this game tonight and the Bucks playing as well as they did tonight. In saying that, I mean, I think... The Tristan Thompson loss obviously is a tough blow to the team, but I think it's going to be one that the Cavs are going to be better equipped to handle when Evan Mobley comes back and he is getting closer and closer to a return. And saying all of that, I thought Damian Jones held his own tonight. Look, like it was a tough matchup for anybody on the Cavs. And Damian Jones is, is not somebody that the Cavs are going to be comfortable playing 20 to 25 minutes. But in his 10 minutes, he was active. He didn't look completely out of place the way that he did at the beginning of the season when he got pulled from the rotation. He made an impact offensively. He made an impact defensively. I thought he played with some force underneath around the rim. It's just that the Cavs had a bad night offensively and defensively, and they just didn't have enough for this version of the Milwaukee Bucks. And I think that's just the reality of what happened. And I think it just shows the difference between the Cavs and the Bucks. There still is a perceivable gap between these two teams. Yeah, Chris, and I'm not really surprised that Damian Jones got a lot of his minutes in the first half and then kind of dwindled away. Well, it dwindled playing. away because JB talked about this too after the game, Ethan. It dwindled away because the Cavs needed an offensive jolt and they went to George Niang as the small ball five so that they could put a five shooter lineup out there to try and space the floor a little bit better and try and change the look that they were running offensively so that the Bucks had a little bit more to deal with on the defensive end of the floor. And it kind of took the Bucks a little bit to get adjusted to that. So I thought that was an interesting wrinkle that JB used. And I give him credit for that. Didn't mean to cut you off, but he did address that after the game. 
Yeah, no worries. And I'm not surprised that that happened, obviously, because Damian Jones, as we know, even though he did not miss a shot while he was on the court, is not an offensive weapon for the Cavs as of now. So we'll have to wait and see how he might develop in this new role as the big man coming off the bench, especially depending on how much longer Evan Mobley is out. But we are going to get into that later in today's episode. So Speaking of players who will be out of the lineup for a while, Ty Jerome posted a photo collage of him in scrubs in a hospital, potentially getting work done on his ankle. Chris, we had talked before about how Ty hadn't been progressing or he progressed and hit a wall when it came to his recovery. The Cavs haven't announced anything officially for Ty, and the NBA injury report today still said right ankle sprain, but I think him posting about it opens the door for a discussion. Do you have any insight to what he might have gotten done specifically or what his timeline might be for a return? No, no specifics, no timeline. At this point, it's just trying to figure out how to get this ankle back to the level that it needs to be so that Ty feels comfortable with playing a basketball game again. And and so that Ty feels like he is making the progress that he needs to make. And so that Ty feels like he can get back close to full strength and try and be an asset for this team down the stretch. It's obviously been very, very frustrating for him. It's been frustrating for the training staff to try and figure out what they have to do. They've tried multiple treatments. It was a tricky injury from the very beginning. And hopefully this latest approach that they are attempting here is one that is going to get him back on the court soon before the end of the season so that he can find a way, maybe possibly, to get back into the rhythm that he needs to get into and maybe possibly get back into the rotation. Yeah, Chris, I think with Ty Jerome being out for an extended period now, I think it's even more likely for the Cavs to keep an eye on what the Charlotte Hornets are doing with Kyle Lowry. Lowry at 37 was on a steady decline in point production since joining the Heat, but I don't think that doesn't mean he can't add something to a team like the Cavs, who lost a veteran earlier this year in Ricky Rubio and will now be without another guard in Ty Jerome. Craig Porter Jr. played just one minute in the recent game against the Bucks, but right now the three capable point guards until Darius Garland gets back are Donovan Mitchell, Karis LeVert, and Craig. I feel like Kyle's veteran presence would be impactful in Craig's journey, but also mentoring a young team. I think that's also why you saw today that Tristan Thompson, even with the suspension and not being able to be on the sidelines with his teammates during the game, was at practice and still playing that leadership role. Chris, do you think the Cavs would be willing to add a contract knowing that the most significant part of a player would be their supportive and mentorship properties to the team? I mean, I think that's something that they would consider if they feel like there's a void there, no doubt about it. I mean, for the last couple of years, they have used the last roster spot on that kind of guy, somebody who is more impactful behind the scenes than he was on the court, more like a locker room lieutenant. Obviously, Robin Lopez filled that spot last year for the Cavs. It wasn't about what he did on the court. It was more about what he brought behind the scenes. And before that, the Cavs had Ed Davis in that particular role. So I think if they feel like there is a void that needs to be filled there, I think it's something that they would certainly consider. But here's the thing, like that role, Ethan, is not for everybody, okay? And Kyle Lowry is somebody who was not all that happy coming off the bench in Miami when they moved him from the starting lineup to the bench. And if he's going to get bought out, if that happens, and that hasn't happened yet, and maybe he gets traded again, who knows? If he gets bought out, that means he becomes a free agent, and that means he has his choice of teams. I'm not saying that all 30 are going to line up for Kyle Lowry, okay? But there are legitimate contenders in the NBA that are going to want what he still has to offer at this stage of his career, and they might have more of a pressing need for what he brings still on the court. I don't think Kyle Lowry would sign up for this situation in Cleveland unless he felt like he had a path to consistent playing time, unless he felt like he was going to be an every night member of the rotation. He still feels like he can play. He still feels like he can make an impact on the court. 
he would not sign here willingly with the Cavs and turn down other opportunities with other contenders to be a lead cheerleader and to be a locker room lieutenant. That's not happening. Yeah, and I think his relationship with J.B. Bickerstaff and what kind of role that Ricky Rubio had on this team and would have had this season is kind of similar to what role he would be playing. So we'll just have to wait and see what J.B. Bickerstaff and the Cavs can offer him, especially with Darius Garland's return looming. So we'll have to wait and see. I mean, the other thing to consider here, Ethan, is that during this stretch over the last month, when the Cavs have been without Darius Garland and Evan Mobley, they have found something with Donovan Mitchell playing point guard. Donovan looks comfortable running the team. The players around him are involved on each and every possession with him running the team. His assists are up. The ball movement is up. The passes per game for the team, those are up. Donovan has a unique way of engaging his teammates and empowering his teammates and making sure that they're involved and they're in the rhythm of a game. So the Cavs have certainly found something with Donovan in that particular role. They also have Karis LeVert, who can play de facto point guard minutes too. So it's like, it's not as much of a need for this team when they're at full strength to have that kind of guy because they have enough playmakers. They have enough ball handling. Like you can have more, you can have more playmaking, you can have more ball handling, you have more shot creation, but like finding minutes for that type of player is not going to be easy given the roster makeup and given that Karis LeVert, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland can all fill the point guard minutes if needed. It's hard enough for Craig Porter Jr. to find consistent minutes right now. When Ty Jerome gets back, if he ever does get back, it's going to be hard for him to get back into the rotation. So that's something that has to be considered as well. It's not like this is a team that is desperate for a backup point guard because they have nobody else that can run the offense. They have nobody else that can create for themselves or create for others. They do have those guys, even if that means they have to play one position over, which is something that they have found during this stretch. And I think it gives them more comfort when it comes to their backup point guard spot. Chris, I'm a little parched from all the information that we've been giving out and a little debate that we have. It's healthy. So we're going to take a break. So I can get a quick drink. And for our listeners, if you like food and drinks, and who doesn't, Cleveland.com is breaking new ground with our lively new podcast about dining and drinking in the greater Cleveland area. The hosts talk about the latest foodie happenings, joined by the most in-the-know experts in town. It's called Dine, Drink, C-L-E. And you can find it anywhere you download podcasts. Give it a listen and quench your thirst and feed that appetite. When we come back to the Wine and Gold Talk podcast, we're going to discuss the potential return of two starters to the Cavs lineup. But before then, become a Cavs insider and interact with me and Chris by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you, that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from Chris and me. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Man, the Cavs sure like to be dramatic, don't they, Chris? (laughs) Yeah, it's always something with this team. Not only did the announcements come out on the same day that they'd be out for extended periods, but Darius Garland and Evan Mobley could return at the perfect time to save a team that has been supported by role players since December 15th. And I use save as a way of saying, this team is going through a lot. And to have their two star starters return to the lineup, especially with everything going on with Tristan Thompson, especially with Ty Jerome, and just knowing that this next stretch of games will be tough, this is perfect timing. We'll just have to see when they get back. They don't need to be saved, though. Are you kidding me? This team's in a roll. That's what I'm saying. They don't need to be saved. I'm saying the timing is just really good. Well, that's one thing. You said they needed to be saved. They don't need to be saved. They're playing the best basketball of anybody in the NBA. They just need to be boosted. Enhanced. That's probably a better word. 
But it seems as though Darius and Evan are both nearing their returns, and as dramatic as they are, the Cavs had Evan travel with the team to get extra work in while keeping Darius in his now retired blender at home to focus on his conditioning and getting his endurance and agility back up to game speed. We've gotten to see Evan involved in a couple practices now with a compression sleeve on his injured knee while Darius has been limited to the eyes. I think the only time I've seen him warm up in person was the Monday he got his wire removed where he was getting motion shots up at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse ahead of the Cavs game against the Bulls, I believe it was. Do you have any insight on when these guys might be getting back on the court for the Cavs, Chris? They're not on the same timeline, I can tell you that much. Evan Mobley's on this trip with the Cavs for a reason, and Darius Garland is back home in Cleveland also for a reason. My anticipation is that Evan comes back before Darius, and I think Evan is going to beat the timeline that was initially set, which was six to eight weeks, could be two months. Like That's what the Cavs were thinking initially. I would not be surprised if Evan is back next week, actually. He continues to make steady progress. The Cavs are happy with his progress. His knee is feeling better tonight before the game against Milwaukee. He was running full court sprints on the court shortly before tip-off. He was going through a pregame workout. He went through an extensive workout again following shoot-around this morning here in Milwaukee. So a lot of things are positive when it comes to Evan's recovery, and a lot of things are pointing to a return in the very, very near future. In saying that too, like he does not need to wear that compression sleeve. Him and I had a talk about this and it's something that he can wear if he wants to, if he feels comfortable enough to wear it, but it is not required by the doctors. So that's a good sign too, that he doesn't have to wear something to protect that knee that had some work done recently. In fact, today, following shoot around when he was going through a workout on the court, hoisting a bunch of threes from all over the way that he has recently, he was not wearing that compression sleeve. The other day when I saw him in Orlando following shoot around, he was not wearing that compression sleeve. So that would tell me that the healing is going according to plan. There are not many limitations on him. And the Cavs are actually scheduled to practice tomorrow here in Milwaukee. And we'll see if he takes full contact in that practice. We'll see if it is a full contact practice. And if he does take contact, that's one of the last hurdles that he's going to have to clear in his recovery before he can get the green light to play again in a game. And I think the beginning of February, which starts next week, where the Cavs face the injured Grizzlies, the Spurs, the Wizards, and the Nets would be a prime time for the Stars, at least Evan Mobley, to return to the lineup because they can get back up to game speed and game situations against lower tier competition. And then if they need a breather, the Cavs can resort back to the lineup that has been successful over the last 17 games. We've talked about how banking wins can sometimes be helpful, especially in the gauntlet of the Eastern Conference, where teams are basically fighting for the last three spots as an automatic bid into the playoffs instead of having to battle through the play-in tournament. The three spots that are seemingly already filled in the East, as we've mentioned, are by the Celtics, Bucks, and 76ers, who are simply on another tier than the rest of the conference. We've talked about the trade deadline a lot on this podcast, but I wanted to give my thoughts on how the Cavs' outlook could have changed because of the Tristan surprise and him being out until mid-March. We've mentioned looking for a 3 and D player that can bring more of an offensive threat than Isaac Okoro with nearly the same defensive output. I honestly think that if the Cavs want to run the four-shooter lineup with Evan Mobley at the five, then they'll need to use the same scheme they've been using with Isaac and Dean Wade guarding the opposing team's best two perimeter scorers while allowing Evan and Donovan to play free safety and protect the rim and jump the passing lanes. I mentioned getting Kyle Lowry earlier in the podcast. The only way that I think that's a smart move is if the Hornets buy him out and the Cavs can get him on a veteran minimum with the money and roster spot that Ricky Rubio gave back to the team. Also noting that the money Ricky is giving back will be over time, so it's not going to be immediate. But in all honesty, the camaraderie of this team 
has held them together during this rough time with Darius and Evan out. Not rough because of how they played, but because the starters have been out. And no matter who they brought in to replace someone, whether it's Isaac Okoro, Dean Wade, Ty Jerome, whatever it may be, based on the people that we've talked about in previous podcasts about potential trades, I feel like there would be a disconnect because each player on the Cavs not only has a role on the floor, but also in the locker room as well. We're talking about George Niang, talking about Isaac Okoro, talking about Dean Wade. These guys have just genuinely enjoyed playing with each other. And you talk to any one of them and you say that they just like each other. And that's not the same around the league. It's not a common phenomenon. And if you think about adding one person into a mix that could be toxic or could not fit the mesh or whatever it may be, it could deter not only the joy, but how the Cavs are operating. But we don't know if that is the case. I'm just saying that I think that the joy and the camaraderie and the friendships that these guys have made have allowed them to play at a higher level, especially with two of their starters being out, but them still being on the sidelines, still interacting with people and showing that they want to be there and how badly they want to be back in battle with their guys. And going 13-4 and four over 17 games without those star players isn't a feat of luck even if they did have a favorable schedule over that stretch. Chris, how do you feel about everything going on around the Cavs right now? I mean, I think they're in a good place. Are you kidding me? They're in the fourth spot in the Eastern Conference, given everything that they have dealt with throughout the course of this year. Their defense has picked it up recently, even without Evan Mobley. Their offense has risen. They have found a different kind of style that they can go to during certain stretches of the game, or if a defense tries to take away what it is the Cavs want to do. So they can play multiple styles. Their bench has stepped up in a big, big way. They've taken the next man up mentality and and made it more than just some kind of platitude. They're in a really good place. I don't think this is a situation where the Cavs are heading into the trade deadline in a few weeks and they're desperate to do anything because there's a glaring weakness on this roster. I think it's a situation where if they can improve the team while not giving up as much or not giving up players that are meaningful to their success, then I think they'll consider it and they'll probably end up doing it, especially in response to the Knicks making a big trade and the Heat making a big trade and the Indiana Pacers making a big trade as well. And who knows? Milwaukee might make a deal before the deadline. Philadelphia might make a deal before the deadline. They're both equipped to do that. But to be 8-2 and two in the last 10, to be on the roll that they were on, just had their eight-game winning streak ended, fourth seed in the Eastern Conference, It's a really, really good place in saying all of that. They've only had their starting lineup, their projected starting lineup for 11 games. So they have to see like what that looks like and what their ceiling can be. So I don't think this is a team that has to act out of desperation going into the trade deadline. I don't think this is a situation where if the Cavs don't make a deal at the deadline, their chances of getting to the playoffs and winning a first round playoff series are completely doomed. I don't think this is a situation where Tristan Thompson is suspended until the middle of March, so all of a sudden, backup center goes to the top of their trade deadline priority list. I don't get that sense from the organization at all. I still think that they're looking to improve their 3 and D spot. I still think that they're looking to fortify their bench and maybe better the 8th, ninth slash 10th guy, whatever, in that mix of the rotation. But it's not something where it's time to shake up their starting lineup. It's not something where it's time to take somebody out of the rotation or move somebody new into the rotation. It's continuing to build on the things that they have done over the last month, month and a half of this season. Yeah, and we'll have to see how quickly Evan Mobley can get back and how that could affect what they do on the trade deadline. Because if he can fit in with the lineup that they've been putting out and the schemes that they've put together, then they might stay put. And we've mentioned that as well. But with that being said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or Visit cleveland.com backslash calves and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the calves from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard 
is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.